Amen, amen. All right, uh, this morning we're going to look at the final phrase. Next week starts a whole new series called uh, Illuminate, and uh, I'm excited about Jesus, uh, the birth of Jesus, how he illuminates the world. And uh, he, it's going to be a great series. I think it's going to be a great Christmas series. So don't miss it. Be a part of it, and uh, it's going to be a great experience for you. But this morning, uh, we're going to wrap up the final phrase. And I don't know about you, but these phrases, man, they've been cutting, they've been getting a little bit too close to home. I don't know about you, but they've been getting pretty close. And I'm like, Lord, there's some things that you're like stretching me, and I appreciate that. I need that. I've been married for uh, 20 years, and it uh, feels like 40, And because uh, I'm sure it's like, it's like in dog years in marriage, it's like, you know, you, you, you win one year is like three years in life, right? You know, and because and, uh, it is, it's a lot of work. Marriage is hard. And, uh, and I, t- you know, couples come in and get, uh, they want to get married. And, and I say, are you sure? <laughs> you know, are you sure? And because uh, it's tough stuff. And they're like, yeah, we're ready for it. And you really aren't ever ready for it. Hello? Are you ever really ready for it? Not really. But you know that it's going to be a long road and it's going to be worth it. And so uh, there's some phrases uh, that we've been talking about. And, and I hope that they've been an encouragement to you. Uh, the last phrase um, uh, is found in Ephesians 5. So turn there, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 28 through 30 real quick here. And uh, you're going to see it. It's couched in this section to husbands. Uh, Paul's talking to husbands and wives, and he says this in verse 28. He says, in this same way, what he was saying about wives submitting to husbands, husbands loving your wives and all that kind of stuff. He said, he said this. He said, uh, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but what does he do? What does it say? But he, but he what? What's he do? He feeds it and cares for it just as Christ does the church. And then he says, for we are members of his body. And uh, in this section in Ephesians, and if you're, if you're ever considering going to Sunday school, uh, Bill's talking through Ephesians. It could be a great study, uh, verse by verse through that. But what Paul is talking about in marriage, marriage is an example or an expression or, or, or an, an, an idea about what the, it's like between Christ and the, church, the, and the church, between Christ and us, our relationship with him. And he says this, he says that he not only feeds it, but he cares for it. Now, the word cares for is the idea of cherish. It's the idea of cherishing. It's like, and so this is what he's saying. He says, listen, I want you to cherish each other just as Christ does for us. I want you to cherish each other just as Christ cherishes us. Now, what does the word cherish mean? Cherish is like you look at the word cherish. It means like to keep or to cultivate with care and affection. I started thinking about, are there, is, there, is there anything that you cherish in your life? Now, I'm not talking about your spouse right at this moment, but what I want you to consider, is there something that you cherish? I don't know what that may be. It may be like there's a, a, a plate that you, you got from your great-great-grandmother. It's in a, some, you know, you know, wood cabinet with guns, you know, pointing so no one touches it, stuff like that. You take it out, you... You, you kind of clean it once, dust it off and stuff like that. Um, uh, it, it may be uh, like you have your spot, your place in the house, and it's like you let no kids in that area. It's like, don't you even breathe in this room. I mean, this is my room. This is my place and my getaway from all of you little terrors. And uh, so you, whatever it is, you, you cherish it. And I started thinking about, I was back home, and uh, I was with my parents and, and Tiffany's parents, but mostly with my parents, I started thinking about this. I was, I was going around the house, and we were playing, and it's just great. I'm 42 years old, but every time I, I grew up in this house that they're, that they're still in. I mean, my parents uh, moved there in the 70s, and, and I was born in 74, and, uh, and it was great. I loved the house, a little ranch house in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and uh, in the Northbrook uh, field, uh, d- subdivision. And uh, man, when we pulled into the subdivision, again, I'm 42 years old. You would think I'd gotten over this, but I still feel like a kid when I go home. Has that ever happened to you? It's like when you go home to your childhood home, it's like, man, I still, I kind of remember growing up and I remember being here and kind of experiencing this. And anyways, we're like, um, 
we were downstairs, we were playing pool. And uh, billiards, for some of you that don't know what pool is, it's not an indoor pool where you're swimming. You know, it's a pool table, right? And, uh, and I remember when as a kid, I remember dad was kind of like, don't you mess with this table, right? I mean, this was like an expensive table. I mean, it's got the, you know, the stone on top. It's not the wood, you know, where, you know, it's, it's real. I mean, this is the real deal. And uh, I'm downstairs, and I'm playing and all this kind of stuff and, uh, with, with Luke and my, my nieces and nephews. And my nieces and nephews, you know what, they're taking the pool balls, and, and they're like smashing it onto the table. And I'm kind of going, dude, dad's going to come, I mean, grandpa's going to come unglued. You can't do that. And they're looking at me going, what, like seriously? And dad's down there, and he's watching TV. I'm like, dad, dad, look at what they're doing. And he's like, oh, that's all right. And I'm going, wait, that was not what life was like growing up. I mean, like if we sneezed over there, you were over there wiping it down. But it's like you, see, he cherished it. It was like something prized, and it was a super huge possession to him. It's, I cherish it. It's I'm going to keep it. I'm going to cultivate it. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to watch over it. I'm going to give it that, that, that attention that it deserves. So what Jesus says is this. He says, with each other, you are to cherish each other. That you're to look at each other in the church the same way. That when you see somebody, you say, whoa, 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 you're special. You're a child of God. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're an amazing person. I'm going to watch over you, and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that there's no damage. I'm not going to make sure, I'm going to make sure that if somebody sneezes on you, I'm going to start wiping you off, right? I mean, that's going to be a little bit weird uh, if somebody does that to you. But the reality is, you're saying, listen, I cherish you. Now, you don't say that word. You do that word. And I don't know when the last time you ever said to somebody, I cherish you, all right? Have you ever said that? And I started thinking about, has anyone ever said, I cherish you? Uh, to you or you've said it to anybody else just curious raise your hand if you've ever said that before right okay one all right out of all of us one person we don't do it so we're going to practice that this morning because I knew you don't say it much at all we got the stutter over here he's awesome man he knows how to say it but you the rest of us we need to learn how to say it I cherish you because when you understand the word cherish you understand that's a pretty powerful word and it's a beautiful thing when you get cherished So what I want you to do is just tell the person next to you, even if they're not your spouse, okay? Just tell them, listen, I cherish you, all right? Just say, I cherish you. To the right, okay, go ahead and look to the right. Say, I cherish you. Say to the left, if there's somebody to your left, say, I cherish you. I cherish you. Maybe that's the first time you've said that in a long time. Doug, I cherish you, man. I cherish you. you. (laughs) Thanks, man. I appreciate that. (laughs) I cherish you. See, this this is one of those words you're like, listen, we just don't use. We just don't use it. But understanding, this is exactly what Jesus wants us to do for one another. And especially in our marriages. He says, I want you to cherish each other. And I think the best way to express this, Peter probably did not realize, okay, I'm guessing here, but he probably didn't realize what he said in 1 Peter 2.9 really describes cherishing somebody. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want you to turn there in your Bibles. We're going to go to a couple different places um, but as, as we talk about cherishing. But 1 Peter chapter 2, get your sermon notes out. There's three things you're going to see in here uh, that I want you to write down and get a hold of for your own, uh, in your own marriage. Okay, and, But not just your marriage, just for one, of, uh, one, uh, one another. All right. So we're going to do what Jesus does. He cherished us. How does he do it? And this is what Peter says in verse 9. He says this, but you, talking about us, the people of God. He says, but you are a what? What's the first first thing? You're a chosen people. That's the first thing when it comes to uh, cherishing your chosen people. He doesn't realize it maybe, uh, but, but it's a powerful thing. He says, a royal priesthood, that's the second, and a holy nation, that's the third. So these are the three things that describe cherishing somebody. That's just how Jesus cherished us. This is how Jesus cherishes you. He has chosen you, you are royal, and you are holy. That's what he's saying. He says, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's what it means to cherish. So we're going to unpack that a little bit here this morning. 
um, that you, these are the three things about getting a hold of this is helping you understand what it means to cherish your spouse. First of all, Peter says, you are a chosen people. You're a chosen people. Now, the word chosen literally means to select, to prefer, to want, to pick out of a number of possibilities. Now, you understand what chosen means, but that's exactly what he's trying to say. Listen, out of all the possibilities that are out there, I, I choose you. Now, Isaiah chapter 41 is a beautiful picture of this. Turn there in your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 41 is where Isaiah writes about this. This is God talking to his people, okay? And he says this in verses 8 through 10. He says, I choose you. Look at this. He says in verse 41, chapter 41, look at verses 8 through 10. But he says, but you, O Israel, my servant. Now Israel, back in the book of Genesis, is known as the guy by the name of Jacob. And he says, uh, but Jacob is, uh, is like this individual, but also Israel is like the people of Israel. And so it's not just the, the, the whole, but the one. And it's not just the one, but the whole, is what he's saying. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have what? What does it say? Whom I have chosen. Whom I have chosen. You, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am what? What does he say? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. He says, I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a, you got to get a hold of this. See, what Jesus is saying, what God is saying to Jacob, to the people of Israel, he's saying, listen, when I look at the world, when I see the world, now, how does God feel about the world? I mean, John tells us in John 3, 16, right? What is God, how does God feel about the world? He loves the world. For God so loved the world. I mean, so you got to understand, what God is doing here, God is... God loves the world, so don't miss out on this, because I want to unpack that a little bit here. But he says this. He says, out of all of the people in the world, I choose you. I choose you. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And listen, I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to take care of you. And, uh, and, and there is nothing that could overcome him. So you got the big guy that's on your corner that's saying, I'm going to watch over you. And it's like, this is an amazing deal. See, it's like, why would you choose me? Why would you choose me? Was, there, was it my extreme good looks, right? You know, it's like, is it that? Is it my incredible intelligence? Is it, is it that? Is it, is it, you know, is it where I'm from? Is it my lineage? It, what is it? And he's saying, listen, out of all of that, I choose you. I don't know about you, but when I was back again, it was just kind of a uh, uh, preparing this message uh, in Iowa was fun because I was able to kind of think about my past. And I remember in elementary school, do they still do this today? And I don't know if they still do this, but do they choose people in like building teams? Like, listen, if they're going to like uh, play kickball or something like that, some of you that have elementary kids in school, do they still choose people? Like, I don't know, you're all looking at me like, yeah, okay, so they do, all right. So you, you get all these people, you get maybe some team captains, and they're, so the first person says, hey, listen, um, uh, and he's looking at the array of kids that are out there. What's the first thing going on in that person's mind? What are they looking for? They're going to play some kickball, all right? What are they looking for? Yeah, they're going to say, who's the best kicker? Who do I think is the best kicker in this room? All right, Doug, and you're the guy. And I said, Doug, come on over. This person over here is over here going, okay, they got the best kicker. Now I need to get somebody that's, that's maybe a good kicker or maybe fast. And all of a sudden, they start going through the evaluations, and then you're one of the last people. Like my wife, if she were here, she's still in Iowa uh, spending some time with the family. But she always joked about she was always picked like second to last or almost last. 
because she's not very coordinated at sports. I mean, she, no, listen, if she tells you she's sports, she's not, okay? It's just not. I mean, she tries, and she's a great girl, and she tries, but that's just not her strength. That's not her strength, and people knew it, and so when they're looking at picking sides, it's like going, listen, you're, I love you, but you're not the one. Listen, if I had to pick her, I would pro- Okay, don't tell her I said this, but I probably would not pick her. If I'm trying to look for talent and stuff like that, I'd be saying, yeah, I think you're great. I choose you, <laughs> you know, and you can go over to the other side. See, listen, I, I love her, but understand, she doesn't have those skills, doesn't have that gifts, and she's used to standing there watching people be picked over her, wondering, am I worth anything? Do I matter to anybody? And it's those moments where it's like, like that. Do you, do you guys remember those days? Do you remember those days? Okay, some of you are like, I forgot about those days. Those are too long ago. Well, they happened, right? So the thing is, this is what God does. God looks at the people of Israel. And if you know anything about the people of Israel, I mean, he, uh, he likens them to sheep. And sheep are not the brightest bulb in the bunch, right? They're not the sharpest sword in the, in the, in the, the ray. They're, you know, this is like the last people you would choose. And God looks and says, the first person that I want to choose is you. I choose you out of them all, out of them all. I choose you. And it's not based upon your strength. It's not based upon your weakness. It's not based upon your intelligence. It's not based upon your looks. It's out of my heart, I choose you. Now, this gets into a whole nother subject about election and different things like that, the doctrine of election and, and stuff like that. But, and, and, and Bill's going to probably get into that, I would assume, in, in class. And, and the idea about election is God chose people uh, to, to be a, a part of his family. And it wasn't based upon foreknowledge, who they are, what they've done, where they've been, all that kind of stuff. And, and this is one of those doctrines that people struggle with, like trying to sort through and understand. And I, I gotta tell you something, listen, I've been around the block a long time, and you know what, there are some things about God that just confound me, all right? And I don't know about you, but possibly they confound you too. And all I have to look back and say, God, you understand what you're doing and you have a plan, but, out of, but God, God loves the world, but God says, I choose you. And in, and in um, when I was 13 years old, when I was 13 years old, my number was called. God said, I choose you. And I remember thinking, I, why? Why would you choose me? Why would, why would you choose to give me anything? I, have rejected, I had rejected him. I was not interested in God. And there was no interest. There was no leaning. But yet God looks at me and says, I want, I want him. I choose you. See, when Jesus cherishes us, when God cherishes us, you look at this idea. Peter's saying, God chose you. you got to understand. That's a huge thing. That, that God literally chose you. And that's part of cherishing. Is, I, is being chosen. Now listen, uh, do the choices I make reflect my choice in choosing you? See, the reality is this. Like, when I'm looking at, when I'm looking at my spouse, I chose her. And I'm, I'm so grateful I did. Because I look back and I think, man, of, of all the choices of, of people that were out there, I chose you. I chose you. You and I get to share this life together. You and I get to walk this journey of life together. And that's part of cherishing. So in your marriage, what you're literally doing, when you cherish the person that you are sharing life with, listen, you're saying, of all the people, I want you to know, I chose you. I chose you. Cherish them. Now, the second thing that Peter says, not only are you a chosen people, but you're a royal priesthood. Now, the, the, the royal part is, the whole idea is of sovereign, like, descent. You are majestic. It's like, um, whenever we think of royalty, we always think of the East, right? We th- start thinking about, like, London and all this kind of stuff and the, 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 the family uh, uh, over there. And we, we start thinking about, uh, this, is, this is royalty, 
And what he's saying is literally you, you, you see each other as who you really are, and that is that you are royalty. I love what, what John writes in Revelation chapter 1. Turn there, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, this is what John writes, and uh, John has received this revelation uh, about the future, and uh, in, in the beginning dialogue, this is what he says in Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 5. And uh, he says this, grace and peace to you from, from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead the, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a what? has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. The idea here is, John is saying is, listen, you are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the king. And that's who you are. Now, whenever you are in, some, in, in the presence of somebody of royalty, there's an attitude that comes with it. It's like an attitude of respect. It's like you might be a little more courteous, you might be a little more diplomatic, and you kind of see things a little bit differently. You're not going to just kind of be off the cuff and all this kind of stuff when you look at somebody that's royal. Um, you're going you're gonna to be like, listen, um, they're like, uh, this is like nobility. This is somebody that is like special. Like when they say majestic, it's like you are, it's like a, a, different, a different kind of experience. I see you differently than just kind of the, the regular everyday Joe. I, you, are, you are very, very special. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. And, and so when I look at you, I look at you with respect. And I don't know about you, but um, being respected is an amazing thing. Like, we live in a culture of disrespect, right? I mean, people are disrespecting because in a, in a way, it's kind of like, listen, I don't know you and I don't what? I don't care. So whatever flies out of my mouth, whatever I do, it doesn't matter. See, there's things that you will do in your car with people that you do not even know, that you don't even know where they're going, than you would do with the people in your own house. Why? What's the difference? It's because I don't know you and I don't care. So whatever you think, whatever you say, whatever you do, it's like whatever. It's kind of like a free-for-all. But the reality is, in family, what he's saying is, respect, I respect you. In loving God, cherishing us, he not only chose us, but there's a respect because he sees us for who he has made us to be, and that is sons of the king and daughters of the king. And what he's saying is, I want you to respect each other. I want you to respect each other. And it was interesting. I had heard a message just about two weeks ago about this very issue. I, I watched church services online and uh, kind of feeding my soul. And, um, and so I heard this message. There were 10 thoughts that this guy gave about respecting other people. And I wrote them down because I thought, that's, that's really good. These were good for me. I needed this. I needed this. He said, number one, see people as image bearers. See people as image bearers. The imago Dei, that these are people that are made in the image of God. Whether they're in the grocery store, whether they're, um, they're in the factory, whether they're here at church, wherever you go, see people as the image bearers of God. Number two, differ without demonizing. Differ without demonizing. I thought that was really good. See, we live in a culture where we may differ with our opinions, but man, if you watch the Facebook feeds, wow, we demonize people. And all of a sudden, it's, a, it's an ugly looking situation. And what he's saying is, you can respect somebody, you can differ with somebody without demonizing them. Number three, believe the best about people. Believe the best about people. You ever have this like attitude, like, man, they just, they're, you know, we, we can already come in the negative uh, when, it looks at, when we look at people. Number four, don't interrupt or dominate. Don't interrupt or dominate. In conversation, you ever interrupt somebody? You ever try to dominate a conversation? I thought, oh, man, I saw this this last week, man, at family. You know, you're talking, all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of a sentence, and my sister cut me completely off, and I punched her in the nose. No, I didn't do that, all right? 
But I was like, no, what are you doing? I was like, I, 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 hey, listen, respect me. Allow me to just finish what I'm saying. I don't mind you having a conversation. Uh, no incendiary words. I mean, listen, we know what kind of fires each other up, right? And uh, sometimes we do it to push some buttons. Number six, courteous to everyone. And you know, that, that may just simply mean hold the door for somebody. That may say, you know, hey, listen, let me take that cart back up there. You know, just be courteous to everyone. Uh, listen, I, I know number seven was no stereotype, and I thought this was good. We, we are quick to stereotype. We are quick to compartmentalize and put people where we think people need to be. Number eight, we need to apologize quickly. We talked about forgiveness last week. Apologize quickly. When you, when you know, it's like, listen, I, 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 you know, there's a, a point. I shared a story last week about loot forgetting my wallet. And that was the one thing that I didn't realize, and sometimes we don't realize. But the reality is this. When you realize what you've done, listen, kind of swallow your pride and apologize. Apologize quickly. Um, and then number nine, form opinions carefully. Uh, we've got, we're quick to form opinions and we hold on to those opinions even if they aren't even what? True. Number 10, um, be prompt and be faithful. You know, be, be a person that is a, is a person of their word and uh, is committed. And I heard that and I was kind of going, man, do I, do I respect people that way? Do I respect people that way? Not only do I respect people that way, do I respect my spouse that way? Do I respect my spouse? Do I see my wife as a daughter of the king? And if I saw her for who she really is, would, I, would some of the words, would some of the attitudes, would some of the actions be flying out of me if I recognized whose presence I was in? I'm in the presence of a daughter of a king, not just any king, the king of kings. And see, you are in the presence of, of royalty with a spouse. So maybe the words that are coming out of your mouth, maybe you need to rethink some of those things that are coming out. Maybe some of the attitudes that you have towards each other, maybe you need to start saying, man, listen, you know, I need to kind of slow down on this. I realize that, that we are frustrated or we're angry or we're disappointed. We've got some issues with each other. But listen, my question for you is this. Not only do I, do I cherish my spouse, I have chosen them. Do they understand that, that, that I, I want them? I want them. And not only that, I want them to know that they are respected. That I respect them as a child of the king. Now, the last one is this. He says, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Literally, the word holy is sacred. It is, um, it is uh, set apart. It is like, listen, you are, there, there is, you're like out of, out of the hole and, and, and all on your own. And that's exactly what, Jesus, what God was trying to say in Leviticus chapter 20. You still with me? Are you still with me? You hanging in there. All right, Leviticus 20, turn there. Leviticus 20, probably the first time you've been in Leviticus in about three years. Uh, Leviticus chapter 20, uh, turn there real quick. Uh, Leviticus 20, some of you are waiting for the screen, I love it. Uh, Leviticus 20, verse 26. I mean, sometimes you gotta open up your Bibles. I know you got it on your phone. It just helps to remember kind of where things are at. So don't, don't neglect that if you can. But in verse 26, this is what he says. In verse 26, he's saying to the people of Israel, you are to be holy to who? You're to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Listen, I have set you apart. It's you and me. That, that there is no comparison and there's no competition in this relationship. I'm not going to compare you to the other people. And, and believe me, if there's anyone that could, it'd be God. He could. But God says, I'm not going to compare you. You are mine. I have taken you. I have set you apart. There is no one like you in my mind. 
There is no comparison. There's no competition. I'm not looking at the people over here and looking at their track record going, oh man, they're looking pretty good. And I'm, I'm kind of dealing with, you know, man, ah, uh, you know. He's saying there's no com- competition. There's no comparison. What he's saying here in Leviticus, he's saying, you are holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart. Another verse that we know is that God, God is a, a jealous God. That, In other words, what he's saying is, listen, I'm consumed with you. Listen, there is no competition. There is no comparison. I've chosen you, and my attention is with you. So when Peter was saying this, he's saying, you're holy. He's saying, listen, there is no comparison and no competition. And my question for you is this. Do your, does your spouse feel that way with you? Do, do they feel secure that your heart and your eyes are for them? I got to tell you, my wife. I, I try to. I try to. I try to let her know this. That listen, there is no comparison and there's no competition. Um, I've taken in choosing her and seen her for who she really is. She is out of the mix, and she's over here. And I and 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 I have to fight to make sure that that I don't even realize anybody else exists. Now I know you all exist, but she has my heart. There is no competition. There's nothing over here that should be able to entice me to take me away. God's saying, nothing takes me away from you. He's saying, that is how you should see each other. Does does your spouse feel secure knowing that your eyes and your heart are for them? Do they feel that security? Do they know that? See, this is what Peter is saying. This is how you can know that you are cherished by God, that you have been chosen, that you are seen as royalty, and that you are holy. And he does all of this. Now turn back, last, last place, back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at this with me. He says, all of this, he says in, in chapter 2, verse 9, he says, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You see, when you cherish your spouse this way, you declare the praises of God. You declare the praises of God. And I think, wow, what a beautiful thing that when we cherish each other this way, we let the world know that the praises of God, that he, what he has to say is true and right and worth listening to. So my question for you this morning as we wrap things up is do you cherish your spouse? Do you cherish them? Only you can answer that question because you know what cherishing looks like. You've cherished a few things in your life. What he's saying is we're supposed to cherish each other that way. We're supposed to cherish our spouse as Christ cherishes us, as God cherishes us, that you are chosen. Out of all the people, I choose you, that I see you as royalty and I respect you and I'll see you as who you really are and you are set apart. There is no comparison. There is no competition. This is just you and I. That's how you cherish your spouse cherish your spouse let's stand for a closing prayer we've got some folks that are going to come and uh, maybe there's some things you have prayers about I know my brother-in-law I know Betty's son and maybe there's some other things that you got going on in your life that you want to pray about maybe you got some health concerns or maybe you got some issues coming up with the holidays you have things that are that are coming at the end of the year different things that are happening in your life maybe you've got some some stuff going on in relationships they're here they love you and they want to pray for you. And I, and I hope that you will come and, uh, and pray with them. And uh, let them know and put their arms around you and love on you. And uh, to let you know that. And just to cherish you a little. And uh, let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for how you've cherished us. God, we are still in awe of this. You, you did this for us. And we're still kind of wondering why but yet it is because of a deep love that you have for us. 
And I pray, God, this morning that, that maybe for that relationship between us and you, maybe that has just inspired a little bit more about how rich and awesome that relationship is. And I pray, God, that you would help us not only to cherish each other, but in marriage specifically. I pray that you'd help us to cherish our spouse. Help them to know that they are cherished, that they are loved in a way that we have been cherished by God. And that we're going to look at each other as, I've chosen you, and, 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 and you are royalty to me. And, and, and listen, um, you are holy. You are set apart. There is no comparison, no competition. And God, when we feel that security from each other, man, that, what a beautiful thing that we can experience in marriage. God, I pray that you would strengthen us, help us. We can't do this alone. I know that uh, we try, but in our own strength, we can't do this alone. So Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would empower us to cherish each other as you have cherished us. We love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Come up and pray. These folks.